Hi, my name is Jeff Avery. I'm an academic advisor in the School of Computer Science, and I'd like to talk to you today about course enrollment. This is the second part of a very small series. Uh, the first video is about course selection and the course selection process. I want to follow up today to talk about actually registering for courses and enrolling in courses. So I'm going to flip over and I'm going to um, walk you through a number of things um, um, on the website. And we're going to alternate between that and some notes that I'm taking. So the first place we should look to remind ourselves is here, the course selection page. We talked about this um, in the last video, right? So if you go to cs.uwaterloo.ca, the sidebar here under current undergraduates, BCS and BMath CS majors, CS course selection. It's the first link, right? So the course selection process, this is, as a quick reminder, um, this is the term before you intend to take courses. You're expected to course select your courses. That means telling us what you're going to take. Um, we use that information for sectioning to determine uh, the class sizes, where we can hold the classes, and so on, and avoid things like time conflicts. Um, after that, after sectioning is done, you're going to be placed into courses, usually a, about six weeks before the start of the term. All right, um, And then there's a period of time where you're allowed to m make adjustments to whatever courses you've been placed in. Um, the important thing to keep in mind here is that we only do enrollment, automatic enrollment for people that have course selected. So, you know, if you haven't course selected and you hit the drop add period, you're sort of on your own. You won't have any courses and you're going to have to figure out how to get into your own course courses during that period of time. So that's what we're talking about today. I want to talk about how to get into classes, right? Um, and some of the complications that can arise. So um, a couple other places you really need to be looking here. The first one is the course enrollment page off to the side. If you go down here on the left, it's just underneath course selection, course enrollment. And this is um, set up as a series of sort of questions and answers as to the common things that can occur uh, when you're looking for classes. So the first thing I want to do is actually walk through the process of looking for a course and trying to um, register for a course. I can't do all of the steps that you would do. I don't have the same accounts and quests that you would as a student, so I can't really demonstrate adding a course in Quest. But I can certainly show you the thought process that you should be walking through to think about courses. So, um, so first, the first thing you should be doing, of course, is knowing what you're going to take. Under BMath and BCS and BMath um, CS majors, there's a number of things like prerequisite chain lists, program checklists, suggested course sequences. So if you're not sure what to take, I would suggest that you take a look at the courses that you require. All of the information is here. That'll tell you what you should be taking at a given time. Um, Assuming you know what courses you want, and you may not have gotten the courses during course selection, the next place you would go would be to actually look at what courses are offered um, and sort of figure out if the course that you want is actually available, if there's any space in it. The way you do that is through the CSCF homepage. That's the Computer Science Facility Home. Um, I guess the longer way to find it would be cs.uwaterloo.ca slash CSCF. That'll take you to their homepage. And partway down the page, you'll see class schedules that will take you here. Bookmark this. This is an exceptionally useful tool they put together for us and for you. Um, the idea here is you can pick the term, pick the level of courses you want, the course area, pick a course code, and hit schedules. And this is how you find out what courses have space. I do want to spend, I mean, this is sort of obvious if you've seen it before. Um, but I do want to talk a little bit about the information that's on this page because it can be a little bit misleading, um, depending on where you're coming from. So um, what information do we have? Um, subject and catalog number should be straightforward. Number of units should be straightforward. The title is the title of the course. I think that stuff is usually fine, right? I think what people struggle with is how to interpret the numbers that they see on the page. So the way this is set up, there's a class number here on the left, which is sort of a unique identifier for that section. There's lecture sections, 41, 42, and so on, labs, corresponding labs, and so on. Um, if a class has lectures and labs and a test slot, you'll need to choose a lecture and a lab when you try to add that course in Quest, okay? Um, so the numbers are the important thing here, though. So you're going to see a couple different numbers. Um, I'm actually looking at courses for the fall of 2020, which hasn't started yet. Um, just to sort of show you, you know, where we're at for this course. So there's two numbers that you need to watch, and these are frankly the only numbers you should really be paying any, any attention to. The first is this enrollment cap. Enrollment cap is the total number of people that we're allowing into that course in that section, okay? So we have 120 spots allocated for section 041 for this particular course. 
Enrollment total is the current number that are registered for it. At this time of year, I'm in the middle of a, we're in the middle of the spring term. Scheduling hasn't been done yet. P students haven't been slotted yet. They're still, we're still going through course selection at this point in time. So nobody's been registered for it, okay? But if we were in the middle of drop add, that number might be anything from, you know, one to 120 representing a course being full, okay? Don't look at other numbers. There's a weight cap number. There's a weight total number. That rep that's um, used by other departments in the school. Computer science does not use weight cap or weight total. They're meaningless numbers to us. Please ignore them, okay? Enrollment cap, enrollment total are the only numbers that matter for you. Um, there's one little nuance here, and the reason I pulled this page up is because there's something else you can see here, this line that says reserve, reserve year one GBDA with 90 spots. What does that mean? Well, some courses, not every course, but some courses um, are required courses for particular people um, within math or even outside of math. And sometimes what we'll do is we'll put a reserve on a particular course to say that we have a number of seats that we're holding for people in that particular condition. So in this case, 90 out of 120 spots are being held for GBDA students because this is a required course for them. It's not a required course for CS students. It's practically, it's frankly offered for them. So this makes sense, right? Um, what this means is if you're going to use up one of those 90 spots, you have to be a GBDA student. Um, and there's room for only 30 other students who are non-GBDA. And Quest will track these numbers as you're doing this. But sometimes what you can find, for instance, it might not be unusual to go to this and, um, and see that it looks like, you know, maybe there's 118 total, 120 cap, and you think, great, there's two spots, but the two spots are actually part of the GBDA reserve. You know, you might have 88 of, out of 90. That should indicate to you that, sure, there's two spots, but they're not for a regular, they're not for a non-GBDA student. You have to meet that criteria to be allowed to take those seats, okay? So it's something to watch out for when you're looking for courses. You should be able to find, frankly, every course you're looking for here. Um, you can sort of pick and choose. And like I said, most courses don't have reserves, so you don't typically have to worry about that, but it's something to be aware of when you're looking for courses. So um, I'm gonna flip over a little bit here. I've actually got to check this because there's enough topics here. I wanna make sure we cover everything adequately. So during the drop ad period, right, um, you've, you know, what can happen is you can course select and you might not get all your course selected courses. You may need to add some more courses or you may not have course selected at all. At either of these cases, you know, you're likely gonna to have to go through drop this drop ad period of time um, and use that class schedule page that I just showed you to find classes um, and register yourself in classes, okay? Um, keep track of course reserves because again, they indicate that there's there may be spots that look open, but, but technically you won't be able to take them because they're reserved for somebody else. We do not override reserves. Don't ask us to. <laughs> we have to put them there for a particular reason. So if you email us and say, I know it's a GBA spot, but I really want it during drop ads, certainly we're going to say no, okay? Um, Part of the reason for this, it's not because we're being mean or cruel, it's because um, GBDA has a particular need for these, these courses and we have to make sure that we respect their, their requirements and we actually get them the courses they need. So that's, it's really important that we do that. One thing to keep in mind is here on the left-hand side, I've got dates for the terms. So fall drop and ad for the fall 2020 term is July 30th to August 5th. This is the period of time when you're most likely gonna be trying to fulfill your schedule. You might not get that course you want in time, you may have to do it later, right? In which case you can keep trying until the term has started. Additionally, related to course reserves, we remove the reserves on September 11th. So if you hit September 11th, which is I think about day um, 8, 9, 10, 11, day four in the term, typically we remove the reserves. So in my example with GBDA, if there were two reserve spots left, we would get rid of the reserve and those spots would open up for anybody else, okay? So that's sometimes a second chance to get a shot at getting into a class. All right, so again, we're talking about during the drop and ad period. So, you know, you're looking for courses, you've got, you've figured out how the reserves work, you're finding courses, um, you're getting spots or not getting spots in, in courses. Um, sometimes it can happen that during drop ad, you're not gonna get the courses you want, especially if you didn't course select. Um, so you, you might be tempted to email us and try to get us to get you into them. So I wanna explain a little bit how we actually manage courses and overrides because a common question is, I didn't get the course I wanted, can you override me in? In other words, can you make a space for me? So I wanna talk about how we actually handle overrides in the department. So 
we have a so we have a course cap for every course. That's that enrollment total that I showed you. Um, the number you're going to see during drop ad isn't the actual number because what we do is we reserve 15% roughly of all the seats for a course. Um, and we put those seats aside. So during drop ad, you're seeing the final number minus 15% is what's available to you. The reason being that there are, there are people that we have to prioritize getting into a course. Um, for instance, somebody who's failed a required course and needs to repeat it, we will help them get into it. Um, it isn't realistic to expect them to have course selected it because they probably thought they were gonna pass it the previous term, right? So that's a case where we can justify prioritizing getting that person into a course. Um, what else? Um, somebody who course selected and didn't get a course because of a time conflict. It wasn't their fault. So that's somebody else we will prioritize. So we call these special cases, okay? And the 15% of seats we put aside are for us to use in these special cases. Um, if you go to the website and take a look, we actually, we're pretty clear on what the special cases are. If you go back to course enrollment, go down, there's an actual section. Can I get an override? Am I a special case? Here are literally the ones that we, we will consider. Um, you know, somebody who participated in course selection, this is important. In other words, you course selected a course, but you didn't get in because the registrar didn't give enough space or there was a time conflict or some kind of a block that wasn't your fault or you failed a course. If these things happened to you, you course selected and any of these things happened, and you didn't get into a course, then contact us and we will attempt to override you in if we can, okay? That's what that 15% of seats is for. Um, other exceptional circumstances, you recently transferred to CS. Imagine that you applied and you didn't get into CS until the day the term started. That's a bit of a special case as well. You were hospitalized. There were a bunch of other things that could happen, but that's about it. Um, we will not put you into a course because you forgot to course select. Forgetting to course select, I'm even gonna write it down. We will not override you in, period. Um, unfortunately, that's your responsibility. Um, and certainly during drop and add, we can't, we can't justify doing that. We have to save those seats for people that um, did what they were supposed to do and, and got into a difficult situation, you know, in spite of that. So forgetting to course select, unfortunately, we can't do much about that. Um, you're just going to have to try and work yourself to try to wait for a space to free up and, and to get in, okay? Um, so, you know, this is, the, this is how drop and ad works, okay? The drop and ad period, I've sort of written down here, um, July 30th to August 5th, that's the official drop ad period. Um, but space will continue to be open. Um, and space will continue to be made available to you. It's not uncommon to be going into a term trying to manage courses and trying to still get into classes, okay? Um, something else to be aware of, this cap that we have, this 15% that we put aside, we hold on to that until about day five of the term. And then if there's any spots left, we will release them back into Quest, okay? So, you know, imagine we have we have 15%. It looks like the, you, and you can't see these, frankly, they're sort of hidden to you. But the end result is going to be that if there's extra spaces left, what you may see happen on September 14th, on day five, is all of a sudden the totals in Quest will go up for a particular course by some amount. Um, this isn't a guaranteed thing. I mean, we certainly guarantee that we'll release spaces, but unfortunately we can't guarantee there's going to be spaces left. Um, practically, there's usually spaces freed up at this time in most of our courses. So if you're, again, having a hard time getting into something, um, you know, you'll often find that you're going to get into it sort of on day five of, uh, of the term. All right, so don't give up. The last thing I need to talk about is something called a wait list. This causes tons of confusion. So in some departments, wait lists mean there's a waiting list for all courses. Quest actually have this, has this ability to let departments around the school sort of track students through a wait list. We don't do that. That's not what this means, okay? We have a very specific purpose for wait lists, and that is if um, students course select a particular course, and the registrar's office schedules it, and they don't give us a big enough room for the people that course selected, 
um, that's a problem. You know, imagine that we have 150 people that course selected it and did the right thing, and then they give us a class that holds 125. All of a sudden, we're at a deficit, and we can't help those students, even though they did what they were supposed to do. So wait lists are overflow from course selection. That's all they are, okay? So um, what we'll do is if the example I gave, you know, we have 150 course selected, the room holds 125, we'll schedule in the first 125 and then the remaining 25 go on a waiting list that we will individually manage. That means somebody, an advisor like me, will wait for a space to open up in one of these courses that has a wait list, and then we will contact the next person on our waiting list and attempt to put them in that course. And we will manually manage admission to that course until we've gone through the entire waiting list. Now, obviously, that can't work. That kind of a system can't work if everybody is just allowed to add themselves, right? So what we do is we add something called department consent on a course that has a wait list. And you'll know this because you'll go to add a course in Quest, like you'll go and look it up in the schedule and it looks like it has space. And you'll go to add it in Quest and you'll get an error that says department consent required. What that means is it's waitlisted. You will not get into it, okay? Unfortunately, as I was saying, waitlists are overflow from course selection. That's the only reason we put somebody on a waiting list. Unfortunately, we can't add you to a waiting list. We can't modify the waiting list. Um, so for these courses that are, are waitlisted, my best advice is um, keep an eye on the computer science website. Um, we have a blog as well that you can find through the CS Advisors homepage. Um, we will post on the course enrollment page, we will post the list of the waitlisted courses. And like I said, you will get this error in Quest when you try to add them. Um, so you'll know that that particular course is waitlisted. When the waitlist is cleared, you know, imagine that we work really hard and we get through the 25 students that I mentioned that might not have gotten into that course. Then we remove the waitlist, we open the course up again, and then at that point forward, any spots that might come available are up for grabs. Um, we try really hard, managing waitlists is difficult as you can imagine, we try really hard to get through waiting lists before the start of the term, but it's not a guarantee. It sometimes happens that we go into the term and we still have waitlists. Um, and again, we try our best to sort of exhaust them. There is no official date for waitlists to be removed. Um, because our, our philosophy is if you're on the wait list, you should be a priority regardless. So we continue working with that. And we, there's not a date for automatic removal of the wait list. We just have to sort of wait to get through, through everybody. So that's about the end of this. This is probably the longest video that we will ever record. It's the most complicated topic we get into, and it's, um, it's a particularly um, difficult one to sort of get your head around. Um, my advice looking at this is, is keep track of the, the course selection and course enrollment web pages um, that, I, that I pointed out on the, uh, the academic site, okay? Um, all of our information goes here. And frankly, for course enrollment, we've tried really hard to put all of the possible problems you can run into here. I've covered most of them, um, but look for information here first. It will really, really help you figure out what's going on. As you can imagine, we get overrun with requests during drop and add and during the beginning of the term. So um, if you can find an answer here, it's probably faster for you than, than sometimes trying to get in touch with us directly during that time. Um, that's about it. That's all I have to say. Hopefully this helps you out. Um, good luck. As always, course select. Please course select. It's the best thing you can do to uh, ensure that you get the courses that you need and the help that you need. Thanks very much.